There's a meaning crisis going on in the world today. The Book of Mormon is probably the most powerful conduit for personal revelation that I've ever found. Like masculinity and femininity are meant to be together. And so if one of them is having a crisis, the other one's going to have a crisis. I know the God that gave the power to Moses to split the Red Sea answered my prayer. This whole thing is, how is the Book of Mormon answering the question of our time, of the crisis of meaning? And for me, the most profound answer I've ever received was in the Book of Mormon. Every day it permeated my soul. It, got, it made me get up in the morning and think, I want to do something that matters. Hey mate, welcome back to the Stick of Joseph. That's a really bad British accent. I don't know. Ben's gonna laugh at that. that. Well, we already started, so we're gonna keep it. God, well, these one take wonders are, <laughs> are kidding me. We're excited to have Ben Hancock on the program today. If you guys don't know who Ben Hancock is, he runs a YouTube channel called For All the Saints. He's a British Latter Day Saint, and that accounts for the terrible British accent that mm. Jackson tried to do. Indeed. Um, but what what did you like about this episode? Why do people need to stick around and listen to the whole thing? I loved it because personally, and TBH here uh some might be shocked by this i'm kind of with the geography stuff i think it's super interesting i love learning about it i prefer much more getting into the principles and the actual verses of the scriptures that can be applied to our lives mm -hmm. to improve our proximity with god and jesus christ and we kind of go through a lot of the questions of the soul i guess if you will and we go talk about some hot topics. It and, was awesome. And he actually used some verses in a way to explain principles that I had never seen before. Mm -hmm. And it was so cool to get in the scriptures like that. So what we recommend is if you can pop out your scriptures, follow along, and we're going to have a good conversation. Thank you for watching and enjoy the interview. Cool. Well, today we have Big Ben <laughs> coming from the land of Big Ben. Right, and he coincidentally isn't super fond of London. He he prefers uh, middle the boonies, Middlesbrough. Right? Yeah, I, I well, I don't prefer Middlesbrough. Middlesbrough's not very nice either. That's uh, bad. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> I Dolly prefer the rolling, hills. the rolling hills, the rolling hills, cottages, not the bustling uh, city, the the farms, the the countryside. You know, the good old life. Mm. That's what we fought for in Britain. You know, yeah. well, I didn't fight, but yeah, we may have to one day. I one don't day. know. Uh, yeah. Have you ever seen the holiday? The, oh yeah, yeah. yeah so course, you're you're like course. that 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 little cottage. literally that house is probably very similar to to my house. Really? Except I'm not as rich to have it detached. It's can like we do that, a, but attached. can my wife and your wife like can we swap? Like <laughs> you guys come and stay at our place next year. We'll go stay at your place. <laughs> Let's do it. I, I love the architecture here. I wherever I visit, I always love driving around the neighborhoods and seeing what it's like. The and lack of architecture. There's no way you <laughs> like the cookie cutter freaking. There, no, there is what nothing. Townhouses. It's it's mid century yeah. modern. You know, you look at the Provo Temple. It's so unique, and they're ripping it down. I, I'm sad about that. But yeah. Uh, the the architecture here is magnificent. Yeah. It's stunning. Okay, you should well, be proud that, of that. Is a hot just take that I've never heard. Don't go west heard. of the freeway. That's what I'm telling you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we're gonna cut that Bluffdale. part out. Don't go to Bluffdale. <laughs> oh, Bluffdale. Yeah, that's a cutter. That's a cookie cutter place. <laughs> but no, thank you both for having me. What you're doing is brilliant. It's uh, it's obviously resonating as well, which I'm super happy about. The Book of Mormon's amazing, and uh, mm -hmm. it's desperately needed. So yeah, yeah. Well, thank we, you both. we love the Book of Mormon, and what you're doing too is really cool, especially. I, I think you're the only, not not the only, because we, we, we talked to Stephen Murphy, who he runs Mormonism in the Murphy. Yeah, so he's, yeah. he's over on the other side of the pond as well. Um, but you're you're definitely like one of the big voices over there. And I, I think it's I think it's really awesome what you're doing. Uh, before we get into today's subject, tell us a little bit about your story for the for those who don't know. So the, the podcast that you run is called For All Saints, correct? For All the Saints. For All like the, the Saints. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, good hymn. Classic. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us about it. Yeah, well, we were discussing in church in, in Europe, like podcasting really worked during COVID and I've been working podcasting for years and uh, we wanted to continue that but sort of strengthen people's faith, bring refreshing conversations. And so I, I sort of, I teamed up with the More Good Foundation who uh, have been absolutely fantastic and uh, we've created this uh, podcast for all the saints just interviewing people you know your focus is on the book of mormon yeah. and you do it in such a like a great down-to-earth way that really translates and Thank uh you. that's so needed and what i'm doing is kind of like bringing people on who 
you know, our last episode was about the new hymn book, for example, mm-hmm. and just like why it's happening. Uh, just these things to keep you updated, but also to maybe give you a, a new understanding of stuff and a fresh perspective. Yeah. Yeah. It's all positive, uh, very faith promoting. I, I have no intention of trying to like, deal with dodgy topics you know yeah. i just i just want to it's a hard world anyway i want to sure. get people more open about and we need faith. that that's awesome that's that's super cool what who's been some of your favorite guests that you've had on uh, so yeah. recently i had spencer mcbride on who is a historian who wrote joseph smith for president and oh, uh, that would be i loved learning about his presidential campaign why that was needed what we can learn from it today uh what his policies were um and that got a that got a good response uh and yeah, I, I loved that episode in particular because I'm quite interested in political history. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there's so many. I, I, they're like children, you know. Yeah, I love how all of yeah. them. <laughs> they're all unique and individual. And how long have you been doing it thus far? It, it launched in September, but we were planning it for quite a while. Cool. Uh, and yeah, it's out now. Awesome. Every every Monday. That's awesome. Okay, well, you guys are going to have to check that out. But today we're going to talk about a really cool subject. It was your idea, actually. I really I loved the idea when, I, when Jackson told me it. But we're going to go through some of life's biggest questions, right? Oh, yeah. And we're going to use none other than the Book of Mormon to answer those. Yeah, because I think if what Joseph Smith says and is what, what is outlined in the introduction of the Book of Mormon, that no any man... Uh, can basically read the principles found in the Book of Mormon and come closer to God than by any other book. And I think that with life's unique challenges, everything in here can be applied to those unique challenges. And so, yeah, we, we kind of want to go through with you. And uh, I, I understand you've prepared a couple of <laughs> scriptures that will, will help us to understand how to maneuver these interesting challenges that we have in our life through the Book of Mormon. I'm so jet lagged, and so I thought I can't rely on recall to bring up these specific references that I wanted to <laughs> share. So uh, I've got a yeah, got I've got all notes. of that. I'm glad. I'm glad. Okay, man. What's that? What's the first question that we're trying to answer? Why don't we go? So there's a there's a meaning crisis going on in the world today. I think, especially mm-hmm. with the young, but also, I mean, the highest rate of suicides that happen in the world are like the. 50 year old men category Mm -hmm. which i found quite that's interesting yeah Yeah, uh, and i feel like that's men who have probably been in a routine for a long time and perhaps they're having that meaning crisis of like where am i i may have lost my purpose Mm -hmm. similarly we talk about young boys a lot and how young boys are having a crisis of masculinity and meaning but actually the trends are showing that yes that is happening but what's overtaking them is young girls interesting Uh, and you know what do you we mean by that? What's overtaking them? Uh, so we talk about young boys and how like men aren't being talked about and uh, men are called toxic and all of this. And yeah, mm-hmm. that's true. And we should look after them and we should have those conversations. But in the midst of that, you have these young girls who uh, are growing up and they're experiencing anxiety and depression mm-hmm. at a okay. higher rate. Mm-hmm. Uh, they've lost their identity as much as we struggle to define masculinity. They're struggling to define femininity as as much you know yeah because i think it's all a jumbled mess it's all a jumbled mess and i think you can't you don't misunderstand one without misunderstanding that like one doesn't suffer without the other one suffering Mm -hmm. because they're they're the yin and yang right like masculinity and femininity are meant to be together and so if one of them is having a crisis the other one's going to have a crisis and it's going to manifest in different ways i think a lot right oh yeah but um yeah let's go into so how does the book of mormon teach us about a, a better meaning I mean, I should say the Book of Mormon is probably the most powerful conduit for personal revelation that I've ever found. Uh, Whenever I have a question, immediately upon praying and searching, everything is answered. And I don't say that lightly. I'm not just throwing that out as a soundbite. That Mm -hmm. has happened for me constantly. Even recently, I've had powerful experiences. And so there are so many interpretations of everything that you could take. But one, I want to go to Mormon chapter one. Sweet. First. I'm, I'm going to do seminary challenge here and, and try. See if you can get there quickest. <laughs> oh, I'm in Doctrine and Covenants. That's not good. So Mormon okay. chapter one. Uh, probably, I mean, would you agree, perhaps the most depressing book? Yeah, it's really, really <laughs> sad. <laughs> it is really sad. Anton Roberts, bro. Uh, and, you know, Screw it's... Screw everything uh, up. I'm in ether. Okay, there we go. 
Here we go. This is going to be terrible on audio, isn't it? Because I'm just going to spend like 10 minutes finding over here. It's all good. We'll cut it. Uh, maybe. I've, maybe. I've got it here, though. Kay. Book of Mormon. So, the Book of Mormon in the Book of Mormon. In the Book of Mormon in the Book of Mormon. So we, we know the scene, uh, and this actually sets it up, Mormon 1, 2 to 5. Um, and about the time that Amaron hid up the records unto the Lord, he came unto me, I being about 10 years of age, imagine that. And I began to be learned somewhat after the manner of the learning of my people. And Amaron said unto me, I perceive that thou art a sober child and art quick to observe. Therefore, when ye are about 20 and 4 years old, I would that ye have... I would that ye should remember the things that ye have observed concerning this people. And when ye are of that age, go to the land Antum, unto a hill which shall be called Shim. And there have I deposited unto the Lord all the sacred engravings concerning this people. <coughs> and behold, ye shall take the plates of Nephi unto yourself, and the remainder shall ye leave in a place where they are. And ye shall engrave on the plates of Nephi all the things that ye have observed concerning this people. So... Okay, so what we found here is Mormon's purpose. You mm -hmm. know, <laughs> Mormon has been given a very specific purpose. At the time, I, I wonder how important he felt that purpose was. We know how important it was. In fact, do we even know how important it was? We know yeah. how important it is to each of us. And then we go through, and as we said, this is like the most sad, depressing book ever. But if we go to Mormon chapter 2, straight away as the war begins. Okay. So I'll read... You know what, I, I'm going to read from here because I've copied and pasted rather than okay. finding them all. <laughs> uh, verse 8. But behold, the land was filled with robbers and with Lamanites, and notwithstanding the great destruction which hung over my people, they did not repent of their evil doings. Therefore, there was blood and carnage spread throughout the face of the land, both on the part of the Nephites and also on the Lamanites. And it was one complete revolution throughout all the face of the land. And going from 10 to 15, mm -hmm. uh, I might summarize that, but... yeah came to pass that Nephites began to repent there's increasing lamentation and this last verse oh it kills me every mm -hmm. time uh, 15 and it came to pass that my sorrow did return unto me again and I saw that the day of grace was passed with them both temporally and spiritually for I saw thousands of them hewn down in open rebellion against their God and heaped as dung upon the face of the land and thus 340 mm. and four years passed away. I guess that's super depressing. But <laughs> what is really depressing. What I took from that in my study when I've struggled in the past, y you know, I came into podcasting through a meaning crisis myself. <laughs> I was working at a flooring store. Yeah. Mm. I don't know anything about flooring, but I was advising people on their flooring and I needed <laughs> something greater. But during that, what inspires me is Mormon rightly complains and is upset and laments but we know through that that if he had stuck to his purpose, which he did, and focused on that purpose and said with full integrity, as he did, I know my purpose. And if I focus on this, God's ways are higher than mine. So I guess with the meaning crisis, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this interpretation. But Mormon's such a good example to me of really seeking to find your specific purpose in life. We all have one. And just trying your best to do it, shut out the trends of the world, shut out the lamentations, shut out the depressing things that are going on in the news and just remember your purpose and mm -hmm. do it to the best of your ability and the Lord will make great things come of it as we've seen with Mormon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's awesome. I'll well, hear Jackson. Reading this now, I'm just coming to realize that I'm about to finish up my Mormon year. I'm 24 years old. And uh, <laughs> interesting. <laughs> I never thought of it because we think about, you know, it's my Jordan year when I'm 23, you know yeah. what I'm saying? But now I'm <laughs> it's your Taylor Mormon Swift year. year when it's 22. Which is interesting <laughs> that when we're when I'm 24, we started this up, bro. Yeah. Coincidence? Yeah. I think not. Oh, that's super interesting. Mm -hmm. Second thing, um, I totally think that identity crisis or like purpose crisis is coincides with identity crisis, just like you were saying at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Because if we don't have a clear vision of where we are headed or what we are trying to become, then our purpose is going to coincide with whatever our focus is, right? For mm. example, people in the world today create all manner of ites. And actually, can I can we flip to a scripture here? In, oh, yes. Yeah, let's in do it, Fourth man. Nephi uh, chapter 1. And essentially to set the stage here, we have... You know, 
the most peaceful time in the Book of Mormon, essentially. And in uh, verse 15, it kind of talks about this and why this was such a peaceful time. And it says, And it came to pass that there was no contention in the land because of the love of God, which did dwell in the hearts of the people. And there were no envyings, nor strifes, nor tumults, nor whoredoms, nor lyings, nor murders, nor no manner of lasciviousness. And surely there could have not been a happier people among all the people which had been created by the hand of God. And this is the best verse right here. It says, And there were no robbers, nor no murderers, neither were there Lamanites, nor no manner of ites. But they were in one, the children of Christ and the heirs to the kingdom of God. And so what I learned from this verse here and this whole story of how there could have not been a happier people, and we learned that it was because they all identified and held in number one place of identity a children, a child of God, mm -hmm. heirs to the kingdom of God, children of Christ. And so I see in a world today where everyone is wanting to take hold of your identity, whether it's by your race, gender, your football team that you support. Oh, that's go big Reds, in the UK. Both United, football, let's go. double O and U football. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> <laughs> um, whatever have you, if we ever like let if we ever let one of those identifiers take first place over being a child of God, then our purpose in life is going to be fulfilling that identifier and not fulfilling our identity as a child of God. Mm -hmm. And I feel like if we're focused on a worldly classification, it's only a matter of time, a ticking time bomb before we hit that crisis of identity and meaning and meaning. purpose in life for sure. Yeah, that's so true. If you're, <laughs> that's actually the way I'm looking at it. If you were just meant to, to be a plumber, like you just love fixing, you know, pipes and stuff like that. And then someone puts you in a desk job. It's only a matter of time before you're going to die because you are not meant for corporate America, right? All of us are children of God. And when the world tells us we're supposed to be something else, it's only a matter of time before we feel this disconnect in our soul because we were made to become like our Father in heaven. We were made to become like God. And I think you hit it on the head right there. It's like if we don't have our identity first, our true identity, we will never find our true purpose. And well, here, go ahead. And, and to say, not to say that any of these other things are bad, like we should no. enjoy our culture, celebrate our differences, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But we just shouldn't let those things take first place. And I think that's that's, that's pretty clear. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, and when when you first pose this question of like, where do we find meaning and purpose? The first scripture that came to my mind, Second Nephi chapter two, and I thought of fourteen, and it kind of combines the two answers together. Um, it says, and now my sons, this is Lehi talking to his sons before he dies. I speak unto you these things for your profit and learning for there is a God and he hath created all things, both in the heavens and in the earth and all things that in them are both things to act and things to be acted upon. Now you start off this conversation, Ben talking about like the 50 year old men that just like are this yeah. midlife crisis type thing. And they just feel like they have no purpose and meaning. They're wrapped up in their jobs and their families and they feel lost. And I think recognizing that we were made to act and not be acted upon. Oh, we yeah. were one of those yeah. things. Like it's so easy. And I've done it too, where the times where I felt the most meaningless or I felt the most depressed was when I just felt like life was happening to me. That's a, that's a fun rabbit hole there. Let's yeah. do it. Let's go down the, the rabbit uh, hole. What do you got? This is why I love podcasting and why I, I I was working for a lot of podcasting and that was mm -hmm. really meaningful but I was like I need something of my own and I spoke at a university in yeah. England giving advice to new students and they said okay one final piece of advice and I said uh, while you're while you're studying uh, create something have a creative outlet mm. and what I wanted to say to them but couldn't because it was a secular setting was uh, we are made to create because God is a creator we're made in his image. Mm. We're trying to become like God. Therefore, if we're not creating, we, we live in a consumer culture, yes. by the way. You know, yeah. we love you consuming this. I, I, don't, <laughs> yeah. I don't mean that. Consume there are good more. things to there are good things to consume, and this <laughs> mm -hmm. this is faith promoting, which inspires you to act. But mm -hmm. a lot of things we consume don't inspire us to act, and mm -hmm. it's in acting that we find vibrant faith that then inspires us to act again, brings faith again. And that's spiritual momentum. That's happiness. Yeah. That's 
I mean, following on from that verse yeah, is Moroni 10.32. Moroni 10.32, okay. Uh, this is the best purpose. Uh, I had Brad Wilcox on my podcast, yeah. and I asked him about this sort of meaning crisis, and he uh, he talked about when Richard Reeves visited the Brethren, and uh, he wrote a book about masculinity and, and boys and men, and he was saying, what did he say? You might have to cut this thought process out. It's all good. Uh, oh, yeah, he... Brad Wilcox went to him and showed him the Aaronic Priest theme. Mm -hmm. And Richard Reeves responded and said, if every man and boy had something like this, there wouldn't be a crisis. Mm -hmm. And following on, Moroni 10.32, Yea, come unto Christ and be perfected in him and deny yourselves of all ungodliness. And if ye shall deny yourselves of all ungodliness and love God with all your might, mind and strength, then is his grace sufficient for you, that by his grace ye may be perfect in Christ. And if by the grace of God ye are perfect in Christ, ye can in no wise deny the power of God. Mm. I mean, there's <coughs> purpose. <That laughs> there's <is a laughs> there's mic purpose if we ever need one. Yeah. yeah, come unto Christ. Like that, dude, that, and I love that purpose because you can take it, you know, from the spiritual theological level, like, right? Come unto Christ, the Son of God. He's died for our sins. When we come unto him, we'll receive his grace. We can become like him, right? But then even just on the philosophical level, who is Christ? He's a representation of all that is good. That's why he's a king of kings. He 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 takes every single virtue and he embodies that virtue. Mm -hmm. And so the pursuit of coming unto Christ, just on a philosophical level, is improvement, self-improvement. If yeah. there is a purpose that exists, is to turn us losers. I'm speaking for myself, you guys, and him, not you. <laughs> no, I'm a loser. loser. Don't <laughs> worry. Us, okay, then I all three loser. of us losers, <laughs> and to become not as big of losers like that is a purpose in and of itself and it has nothing to do with our career it yeah. has nothing to do with our our wealth or our social status it has to do with us individually and and that's that on the philosophical level that's what this is it, this is saying it's saying yeah. aim for something higher and that's a purpose yeah and this this whole thing is how is the book of mormon answering the question of our time of the crisis of meaning and for me the most profound answer I've ever received was in the Book of Mormon. Mm. And this might not be the verse that strikes you, you know, but for me, it every day it's permeated my soul. It got, it made me get up in the morning and think, I want to do something that matters. And it was Alma 34, 32. Behold, this life is the time for men to prepare to meet God. Uh, this is a probationary period. That principle, I believe that that is true. Um, I, and, and in fact, I scarcely, when I share my testimony, say I know something is true mm -hmm. because, you yeah. know, mm -hmm. just semantically, mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know, I too, believe yeah. it. Mm -hmm. But I've tested that and I feel like I'm close to saying I know that because the fruits of that have changed my life. Mm -hmm. uh, so anyone struggling with meaning, pray about that verse. And I know, I don't know, maybe you can have the same experience that I had, which mm -hmm. uh, brought my life real you know spice <laughs> yeah <laughs> variety really, you want to spice excitement up alma uh, 34 32 yeah, yeah it's mm -hmm. such an important verse i, I want to ask you jackson real quick what is what is like that principle that gospel principle that you can say like you know you know what i mean because i have one that comes to mind but i want to hear yours do you have one <sighs> like a scripture or something where you're just like oh i know it my bones <laughs> dude i don't know if it's verse specific or scripture specific but from the experiences, like, for example, we went on Conversion to Christ podcast mm -hmm. and we, Good one. And we, yeah, awesome stuff. Shout out Jackson Mars. And I kind of told you about my process in deciding to join the military, right? And yeah. how God gave me such a specific answer, like Jackson Wayne Paul specific. Mm -hmm. And not only from that moment on, and he used the scripture. So, you know what? Yeah, this is all intertwined together. I know that God, the God that gave the power to Moses to split the Red Sea, mm -hmm. answered my prayer, <laughs> which is such a wild thought. And I love thinking about that. It's such a merciful God that when he saw that I was in need of wisdom and I lacked it, and I humbly asked him for it, having faith that I know I would receive an answer from him, he gave it to he me. He hooked dude. it up. That's beautiful. Yeah, that's a good principle. Charles my Spurgeon talks about the Red Sea. He says it's a symbolism of the atonement of Jesus Christ. 
Interesting. In that uh, Jesus Christ parts the Red Sea of God's justice. Mm, that's uh, cool. So, and then cool swallows tidbit. up those who don't who don't <laughs> serve him. <laughs> yeah, I don't know about that. <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> could be. Yeah, could. But be. Uh, yeah, my my thing that I will say, I'm I'm similar to you, like semantically, like once again, like Jordan Peterson. He, when people ask him, do you believe in God? He's like, I act as if God exists. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, <laughs> depends what you mean by ask. Yeah. <laughs> it's complicated. <laughs> Jordan, That's, if you see this, look, bad we're still working bad on our oh, I hope he doesn't. I hope yeah, he doesn't. he'll never see this. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, like how he answers, I act as if God exists, which means, yeah, he believes in God, right? Because he's, he's breaking down the structure of what that means. So it's I have like, a hard I'm time sometimes saying, does, I but, know this or I know that. But one thing that I do know, that one thing is seek ye first the kingdom of God and mm. all these things will be added unto you. I have been taught that a dozen or more times in my life where when I've sought the kingdom of God and I didn't worry about, oh, how am I going to pay the bills? How am I going to do this? The Sticky Joseph is a perfect example. I quit my job completely with two kids, a brand new kid and my wife, and I had no idea how we were going to provide. We didn't really have any savings. Did you really? And somehow we still live in a house and we still have our kids they are all alive still and they're <laughs> fed well. And I, I can't really explain to you how, like wow. we, we made like no money last year, but somehow God has provided. And I just, I know that. So anyone listening, seek the kingdom of God first and everything else will be added onto you. You might not get a Lambo, but you're going to be all right. <laughs> no, I'm getting a Lambo. Yeah, you're going to get a Lambo. I'm out of here. <laughs> I'm out. Uh, <laughs> all right, what's the next question? Well, here. Can oh, I yeah, sorry. You had thing? the thing. Yeah. So in the social media age, when we have these purpose crises, mm. crises, what is it? Crises? crises. <laughs> um, that's the British guy. They know, they know language better than us. Crises. Crises. <laughs> crises. <laughs> um, we, we have social media and we look at people that – we're like, I wish I could have it figured out like Benjamin Hancock from For All the Saints. No, I no, wish yeah, I could have no, it figured no, no. out like Greg Matson from Quick Media. And and a lot of people, uh, we we hear a lot of times. Many church leaders have said that comparison is a thief of joy, right? Mm. But the beautiful thing about this, going back to that verse in Fourth Nephi, is that if we're all under one purpose and striving for one goal, why should we not look to other successes? And rejoice in them. Mm-hmm. And I love mm-hmm. a, a verse in Alma where it, it's the chapter where he's like, I wish I could be an angel of God so I could proclaim the gospel so much more efficiently, you know, yeah. after he's already done so much work Alma for what? the building up of the kingdom of God. Alma 29. Okay. Um, and he's, he's talking about all these awesome things that God has been able to use him as a tool to perform. We're going to be in verses uh, 13 through 16, I think. But essentially, he's talking about all these amazing things that God has been able to do through him and the efforts of his brethren. And uh, it says here, starting in verse 13, it says, Yea, and that same God did establish his church among them, his brethren, essentially. Yea, and that same God hath called me by a holy calling to preach the word unto this people, and hath given me much success in the which my joy is full. But I do not joy in my own success alone, but my joy is more full, more full because of the, the success of my brethren, which have, been up, which have been up to the land of Nephi. Behold, they have labored exceedingly and have brought forth much fruit, and how great shall be their reward. Mm-hmm. And so we see that. That's so good, by the way. Was, yeah, um, so he, good. He, he was joyful because of the things that God was able to do through him, but he says that he was more joyful because he could look around to his brethren that were also striving to be vessels of mm-hmm. God. And he's like, oh, I'm so much more pumped because they're finding success as well. Yeah. Oh, man. I love that. That's and so I feel like it's so applicable. I mean, in our scenario, right? It's so important. Like we were talking about this just barely. It's about this idea of having an abundance mindset. Like in what we're doing, like we're making content about the scriptures and about God and about Jesus Christ. How bad would it be if we were looking around at other people and be like, oh, they have more subs. They have more <laughs> subs than me. They have more views. And then be angry about that. Or like but when Ben like, reaches out to us and we're like, oh, we want to. We want to keep him down. We don't want to promote him. We don't want to promote him with this. Like, <laughs> Thank you. That Thank sort you. of thing. Like, Thank you. No, that's so like that sort of mindset is ridiculous. And 
what this is saying is like God's grace and his love and the joy he has for all of us, it's, it's never ending. It's infinite. And so we don't need to be like checking ourselves compared to other people and worried about whether or not we like, he's not saying, Oh, they converted more people than me. I don't even want to talk about them. You know, mm-hmm. there, he's not comparing baptisms or whatever. Right. And I just, it, it's so easy to do that in today's world on both the good and, and the bad side. You know what I mean? So mm-hmm. absolutely. But. That I've, I will cherish that verse. Uh, I didn't really see it that way. Uh, but You've shown me the light. uh, (laughs) Thank you, Jackson. That's fantastic. (laughs) So good. All right. What's the next question the Book of Mormon is going to answer? Let's go for a really tricky one that links to the first one, which is the mental health crisis. Okay. Now, obviously, kind of touchy. And we're not saying like, it's not right when people are saying, just just be obedient and it'll be fine. Like, Mm -hmm. I have been as a faithful member, I've had difficult struggles with mental health um, and that's not the point of this. It is finding answers in the Book of Mormon that can lead you to uh, proper joy, answers. last joy. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. uh, first, I want to go to Third, third Nephi 8 um, for probably a really interesting symbolic idea. I, I, don't, I haven't found anything that describes depression better. Mm. Um, and this is when, you know, this is b- before the coming of Christ to the Nephites. Can I just say, I love this episode. This is such a, I want to do this stuff more, dude. Talking about the doctrine of the Book of Mormon is amazing. I love this. It's so fun. Uh, Even with jet lag, I'm enjoying (laughs) it. (laughs) Good. It's really fun. Uh, Verses 20 to 23. And it came to pass that there was thick darkness upon all the face of the land. Uh, Again, consider uh, depression and and how it actually real time feels. I mean, uh, yeah, anyway, uh, upon all the face of the land, insomuch that the inhabitants thereof who had not fallen could feel the vapor of darkness. And there could be no light because of the darkness, neither candles, neither torches, neither could there be fire kindled with their fine and exceedingly dry wood, so that there could not be any light at all. And there was not any light seen, neither fire nor glimmer, neither the sun nor the moon nor the stars. For so great were the mists of darkness which were upon the face of the land. And there was great mourning and howling and weeping among all the people continually. Yea, great were the groanings of the people because of the darkness. Hmm. And we, we go to the tree of life as well. You know, when, when the mist of darkness comes upon all the people. Uh, and those who... I take comfort in the fact I've experienced depression in, in my life. Not to the extent of many people who chronically suffer with it. And i I feel for them. I've had a taste of it and it's, it's horrible. Um, and yet I have faith that those who cling to the iron rod as Lehi did and those that made it through the mists of darkness, uh, will not be consumed by that darkness. Uh, and that, that message really touches me because when you're in that moment of anxiety, depression, uh, panic, other bereavement, grief, all these things that really take a toll, uh, it can be hard to believe that it's impermanent. Yeah. Uh, it can be hard to remember that mortal deficiencies are temporary. But that's why clinging onto the iron rod, those who weren't clinging did fall off into the paths. Those who clung on through that mist of darkness were not consumed. And for me, that's been the same when I've, uh, it was a priesthood blessing that helped me turn my situation around when I was dealing with mental health issues. And uh, for me, that was I clung on to that blessing just as I clung on to the word of God in the Book of Mormon. So that's an interesting symbolic view of, of mental health. I don't know what you both yeah. think about that. I love that. And I think the answer to this, and, and this is what's so good is it's, it's universally applicable because what, it, what, it, what happens after all of this Christ comes and he spends yeah. how many days teaching all of these different things and all of these amazing experiences happen, right? And, and the tree of life in First Nephi, that uh-huh. comes straight after. And the tree after. of life, that yeah. comes straight after. And so I guess the point is, is I don't know the specifics. And, you know, I used to help a, a lot of guys, and I still do talk to a lot of guys about overcoming pornography. And I was telling the same thing. Bro, I'm not going to give you the magic bullet. I don't know the magic bullet for overcoming pornography. I don't know the magic bullet for getting out of depression or mm-hmm crippling anxiety but i do know that there is one common variable and he will give you the magic bullet and it's christ 
the son of God and, and clinging to him like to the iron rod, clinging to his words that will lead you out of the darkness. It is Christ, right? The fruit, the glowing fruit that leads him out of the darkness. It is him descending on the Nephites out of that darkness that clears it up. He will. And it's not a, Oh, you're just going to pray it away and it's going to be fine type thing. It's like, no, cling on to Christ, fall at his feet, weep on his feet, and he will heal you. And he'll give you the personalized things that you need to do to get out mm. because I'm not going to give it to you. I can't. It's interesting you say that. And I bet there are people listening that think, well, I believe in Christ and I don't feel that. So what does that mm. look like in real time? And I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on this when you've been in the dark times. Mm-hmm. But for me, that that silver bullet wasn't like, well, I'll make it better then. There mm-hmm. you are. No. I don't feel anxious anymore. What helped me was that through Christ, I understood that it was impermanent, that this is a probationary mm-hmm. period, that this is temporary. Uh, and that answered a lot of questions about suffering in general. Mm-hmm. Like, this is impermanent. Uh, and I think that's so important that we look in Romans. I know this is a Book of Mormon podcast, but you look in Romans. No, no other scriptures. <laughs> we, we <were> few, <laughs> just kidding. Let's get into the Apocrypha. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so in Romans. In Romans, we see how Jesus Christ endured the greatest suffering that anyone's gone through. Mm-hmm. How did he endure the cross? Paul says, look unto me in every... No, that's Doctrine and Covenants. Mm-hmm. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross. Uh, despi- getting rid of the despising and is now set at the right hand of God. Uh, that principle of Jesus endured that cross for the joy that was set before him. He didn't have a hope of, no, I, I know that God's going to stop this right now. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. we can't, we don't know that. There's no silver bullet of that. But what we do know is the joy that was set before us. And we hold that. And that comes through Christ. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. yeah. I, I think of the, I guess, quote unquote, darkest times in my life where I felt most depressed and without answers to questions is personally looking back on it in retrospect now is when I kind of tried to come up with my own solutions for what I thought would solve the issues that I was facing. Mm. And and we kind of see that throughout scripture. Like for example, in the very beginning, when Adam and Eve eat the fruit, what do they do? They make aprons of fig leaves, leaves. right? And they try to solve the problem of, you know, their nakedness, right? And then one of the first things that God does is that he makes coats of skin and close them, close them, right? And so going back to what you're saying, clean to the iron rod, this year for Come Follow Me, when I was reading that story, I, I thought of it, yes, of course, of the scriptures, but also of God's promises. You know, like our word is our bond. If we hold on to God's word and trust in the answers that he gives us for our issues, then I truly believe, you know, after the dark is dark will come, Christ, you know, just like in this story where it's talking about the deepest dark vapor upon the earth, you know, Christ eventually came because if we trust in him, the light will always come. And uh, I see a cool example of this uh, where we try to, you know, make our own, (coughs) where we, where we try to find our own solutions for our issues instead of using God's. Um, And that's in Helam in chapter 13. And to give context, the you know the people are not super righteous right now. They're putting their hearts on their riches, and God essentially says He's going to curse the land to make everything become slippery, which is kind of yeah. silly. I don't know if He just made everything covered in in dish Goop. soap. That so comes up some <laughs> fun images, doesn't yeah, it? Exactly. Falling on ice rinks. It says uh, He's cursed everything be- that it becomes slippery, and so. Uh, we're going to read verse? here, um, we'll say 31. Now we'll do 34. Okay. So essentially he curses the land that everything becomes slippery. And then in 34 it says, behold, we layeth a tool here and on the morrow it is gone. And behold, our swords are taken from us in the day we have sought for them in battle. Yea, and we have hid up our treasures, and they have slipped away from us because of the curse in the land. Oh, that we had repented in the day that the word of the Lord came unto us, for behold, the land is cursed, and all things have become slippery, and we cannot hold them. 
So I think that a lot of people, and this kind of coincides with the question, like, can people outside of the church be happy or people outside of, you know, faith in Christ be happy? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think they can for, you know, a time, a temporal time, if they're focused on just happiness in this life, in this mortal state. But there's going to come a day where the tools that they laid down yesterday to find comfort, to find peace, to find happiness, Protection. they're going to wake up on the morrow and it's going to be gone. <laughs> and in the day of that battle, when they need to pick up those solutions that they've used for years and it's been fine, that sword is not going to be there. And so I think trusting in the, the word of God, even through the dark nights and that dark vapor, it may last three days, but <laughs> after that third day, the light is going to come. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, and it'll be long lasting. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I just think about, you know, when we've talked about this, Jackson and I are in the Marine Corps and what is the, what is the main thing for coping in the Marine Corps? What is, what does every Marine have packed in his lip? <laughs> a zinny zin zin. A zin, a nicotine, a te right? Tempur-pedic upper decky. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's what they call it. <laughs> Ridiculous. But no. And like, obviously <laughs> I, my, my coping, I don't use nicotine, but I use social media, like doom scrolling. You know what I mean? Oh, like yeah. we Reels. have these little things that we use to comfort us, to help us manage with stress, but eventually they will all go away. But the stress, I, I don't think the stress will, the anxiety. Like I, I think a lot of times we think that when we die, just everything's happy, joy. I don't think so. I think it's, I think it's a continuation of where we are right now. And if, if we have found peace in this life, there will be peace in the life to come. I think there's a scripture in the Book of Mormon that talks about finding peace in this life and in the life to come mm. and how that is that is like the gift to those who believe in Jesus Christ. And I, yeah, just going along with that, I don't know the specific answers to your depression or to your anxiety, but I do know that it is through Christ that you will find long-lasting relief. And... It looks like uh, when it comes to the, the practical, because as you pointed out, some people are like, well, I believe in Jesus, but it's not going away. And it's like, no, I understand that there are, there have to be practical things. And like some thoughts I would share in terms of practical things are, um, you know, we learn in the new Testament that we, the saints make up the body of Christ, right? All of us collectively. And so it's using the help of those around us. So going to a therapist, that, that helped me when I struggled a ton. Like I, I've, I've gone to a therapist before. Um, you know, asking help from your friends and family around you. Um, sometimes, you know, part of, I, I think using, you know, the, the medical things that have been provided us as well is something that is good and comes from Christ. And so I, I think that you have to step outside of the box. Like, and, and hold on to Christ, but also remember there are practical things that you can do that is more than just praying and reading the scriptures. I think a lot of times we equate, we equate anything having to do with faith in Jesus Christ to just reading the scriptures and praying, but it's bigger yeah. than that. My mind when you say that was immediately taken to Moroni, who there are so many things that, not the book of Moroni, sorry, Alma 46 specifically. Mm. Captain uh, Moroni. Captain the original Moroni. OG Moroni. Oh, perhaps one of the greatest men to... Ever lived from how um, he did, is described, I would agree with that. Yeah, 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 but who did he write that? Who wrote that? He was the real top G. He was the real <laughs> top G. Andrew Tate, also <laughs> top G. If you're watching, we'd love to have you on the show. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I can, I can guarantee. I would put my life on the fact that Top G will never see this. Mm. I, I don't know. See. I don't know. <laughs> uh, Alma forty six twelve uh, thirteen. Sorry, thirteen K. And he fastened on his head plate. Uh, this is just after he's written the title of Liberty, by the way, literally mm -hmm. the verse after. And he fastened on his headplate and his breastplate and his shields and girded on his armor about his loins. And he took the pole, which had on the, had on the end thereof his rent coat, and he called it the title of Liberty. And then, and he bowed himself to the earth and he prayed mightily unto his God for the blessings of Liberty to rest upon his brethren, so long as there should a band of Christians remain to possess the land. I love that principle of Moroni puts all of the armor that he possibly could on and he's like, I'm ready for battle. I've done what I think mm -hmm. is right. Uh, and then I bow myself down and mightily pray to the Lord. And uh, there are a bunch of things that I learned from that. Of uh, Actually, that relates to 48. Mm -hmm. Like people talk about 48 quite a lot, I think. Yeah. Unless maybe they don't. It's um, a legendary chapter. Yeah. It, 
Oh yeah, eight to ten. Um, yeah, he had been strengthening the armies of the Nephites and erecting small forts or places of resort, throwing up banks of earth round about to enclose his armies, and also building walls of stone to encircle them about, round about their cities and the borders of their lands, yea, all round about the land. And in their weakest fortifications he did place the greater number of men, and thus he did fortify and strengthen the land which was possessed by the Nephites, and thus he was preparing to support their liberty. Um, so I guess what I'm learning from those two things, from what you were saying, is uh, in terms of practicality, the Book of Mormon does give an important principle there, that even in times of peace, what can you be doing to fortify yourself? Mm. Uh, and then once you've done all that you can, uh, then that's the time to cling on, right? You you cling on to the, the Word of God. You pray mightily. But I know for me, that fortifying, I probably guess in today's world that is becoming more and more advanced that a mental health issue will come again um and so i'm thinking to myself well what can i do now to fortify myself for when that comes and you know statistically you would look at relationships uh positive relationships with friends with your spouse uh you would look at um sport physical fitness you know are you engaging in physical activity a healthy amount <clears throat> consumption of content but also consumption physically of, of food and drink what, what am i consuming so there are all these things that you can constantly fortify yourself mm -hmm. but then on top of that spiritually we know the the ultimate answer is the joy that's set before yeah. us so there are i, I learned practical <coughs> things to, for dealing with mental health from the book of mormon as well as those spiritual sure. lessons and yeah. hopefully that might help someone well one thing before we move on to the next question verse seven i love this one because it shows the difference, right, uh, of where people get their power from, right? And so verse 7 of, of chapter 48. Now it came to pass that while Amalickiah, who's the bad guy, had thus been obtaining power by fraud and deceit, Moroni, on the other hand, had been preparing the minds of the people to be faithful unto yeah. the Lord their God. That is so That is so baller. I love that so much. <laughs> it is so cool because it's just like the way to acquire power in this world is... It, you, you can say deceit. through fraud and deceit, right? If, if you're going to go through just a worldly way. But he relied on this, I, like, of praying to God. And, and that, was the, that was the foundation. And then everything else. And then after that, you get, and he also built walls and all this stuff. But the foundation was he's going to build faith in God. Dude, oh, maybe yeah. in another life, I'll get to see... Mel Gibson cast as Captain Moroni. Ah, no. <laughs> He's too old <laughs> now, know. surely. I know. <laughs> I know, dude. Gosh, in his Braveheart days, William yeah. Wallace. Legendary. Oh! <laughs> well, I have, I have some of the scriptures that I, I just thought, what if I just, never mind us discussing them in detail, but if I just throw them out there in case they're yeah, helpful. Yeah, them out, yeah. Uh, Ether 12, 27, and if men come unto me, I will show unto them their weakness. I give unto men weakness that they may be humble, and my grace is sufficient for all men that humble themselves before me. For if they humble themselves before me and have faith in me, then will I make weak things become strong unto them. Following on from the permanence piece, um, we're fallen. So, you know, you can almost accept that there will be difficulty and say, you know what? This isn't a thing that has come to interrupt my life. This is a part of life. And that that brought me some peace. Yeah. Uh, Mosiah twenty four fourteen, And I will also ease the burdens which are put upon your shoulders that even you cannot feel them upon your backs, even while you're in bondage. And this will I do, that ye may stand as witnesses for me hereafter, and that ye may know of a surety that I, the Lord God, do visit my people in their afflictions. Mm -hmm. I've been quite open about my mental health struggles because it was the Lord that brought me out of them. And from this, I, g I gather that the purpose of that was to make me empathize more, uh, stand as a witness that it was him who brought me out of the affliction. Mm. Alma 36, 3, And now, O my son Helaman, behold, thou art in thy youth, and therefore I beseech of thee that thou wilt hear my words and learn of me. For I do know that whosoever shall put their trust in God shall be supported in their trials and their troubles and their afflictions and shall be lifted up at the last day. <clears throat> Finally, uh, probably three of the most important verses in the whole of the Book of Mormon, Alma 7, 11 to 13, mm. uh, really powerful. And he shall go forth, suffering pains and afflictions and temptations of every kind. And this that the word might be fulfilled, which saith he will take upon him the pains and sicknesses of his people. 
and he will take upon him death, that he may loose the bands of death which bind his people, and he will take upon him their infirmities, that his bowels may be filled with mercy according to the flesh, that he may know according to the flesh how to succor his people according to their infirmities. Now the Spirit knoweth all things, nevertheless the Son of God suffereth according to the flesh, that he might take upon him the sins of his people, that he might blot out their transgressions according to the power of his deliverance. And now behold, this is the testimony which is in me. And mm. yeah, that's the testimony which is in me too. I, I love the principle of deliverance. Uh, mm. I've been delivered uh, and you know, I pray that those who are struggling will be as well. That's amazing. I got a quick little download while you were talking there of just a lot of times you might be asking yourself, why have I been given this trial? Why do I suffer from depression, anxiety, or whatever it is, right? And a lot of times we think it can be a sign of God's disfavor in us. When it happens long enough, we can say, what have we done wrong? But look at what you just pointed out here. Look at the, 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 the main story of the Old Testament, which is the Jews in slavery in the Egyptians and them being delivered by God. And then look at Nephi in, you know, first Nephi. How many times does he reference back to that as he's trying to remind his brethren, like God will deliver us. And so those, the Jews who suffered under the hands of the Egyptians made it so that scores and scores of people after them were able to draw back on their experience as a reminder that God will deliver them. Mm. And so when you are struggling with depression, anxiety, or whatever struggle it is that you're having, just remember that as you hold on to God, one day you will be able to stand as a witness and your story may be able to told from generation to generation so that other people may remember that they too will be delivered one day. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Let's hit one more. Let's hit one more question. One more. Let's uh, do one more. I'll give you the menu. Let's do it. Okay. Yeah, and we'll choose. Be more open about your faith, having faith in the future despite struggles and or overcoming doubt. Jackson, choose. Mm. What was the first one? <laughs> Being more open about your faith. Mm. <laughs> what are you gonna do? I say we do that one. I like that one. Okay. I say we do that. Okay. Can I kick that off? Oh, please do. Okay. Yeah. I have yeah. one scripture for that. Um, um, I think about like one thing that I love and I will talk about with anyone is golf. I love Ooh. golf. It's probably because I play it an absurd amount and an unhealthy amount for my bank account and my productivity. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I'm getting better, especially because it's winter. <laughs> that's that's the only reason you're getting golf better is because it's winter. Uh, passes are super expensive. But anyways, um, and I think about why, I, I and I think about that in regards to the gospel, it becomes so much easier to share something when it becomes a part of us, when we are constantly putting effort towards mm -hmm. profounding our knowledge on it, bettering our skill, or making it more of a part of our daily lives, right? And so... In regards to sharing the gospel, it's so easy as a missionary because you wake up, you study for three hours, you leave the house. You wear it on everyone, your chest. Wear it on your chest. Everything about being a missionary is towards that end. And when we get back into the world, it's so hard because we have these many distractions, professions, jobs. And it'd be nice if all we could focus on is the word of God. But the more we focus on it amidst our other trials and distractions and things that um, pull us away, we are going to be way more comfortable and actually anxious and excited to share the gospel. Mm. Yeah. I love that. That's, that's an amen right there. What scripture you got? <laughs> that was an amen. That was brilliant. Uh, Alma chapter 31, five, when, you know, the mission to the Zoramites. Mm -hmm. um, funny thing, this, this Alma, ser no, sorry, that was Alma seven. That sermon, uh, statistically probably would have taken Joseph two hours to translate mm -hmm. that whole beautiful sermon of the atonement mm -hmm. considering mm -hmm. like the scale and the size yeah. of that mm -hmm. incredible anyway Alma 31 5 and now as the preaching of the word had a great tendency to lead the people to do that which was just yea, it had had more powerful effect upon the minds of the people than the sword or anything else which had happened unto them 
Therefore, Alma thought it was expedient that they should try the virtue of the word of God. Mm. Uh, let me just like it had it had, had more powerful effect upon the minds of the people than the sword. Like if a tyrant came and threatened you, more the word of God was more pers- would have was persuasive. Yeah, more persuasive. And I and I look, you know, in America, fifty five percent of young people identify as Christian. According to a criteria of that's very lenient that identifies a committed Christian, someone who lives it, mm-hmm. uh, reads the Bible every now and then, goes to church every now and then, says a prayer every now and then, 8% of people would be classed as a committed Christian, mm-hmm. young, oh gosh. young people in America. So you might despair at that, but I rejoice at that, thinking that, well, that's 55% of people that would be open if I were to actually be open about my faith. Uh, only 8% are already like, no, yeah, I totally get it. You know, mm-hmm. I, I agree. Uh, yeah. The other ones would be like, wow. And when you look at the human flourishment scale, this was a new study done out. And that human flourishing scale, the markers of human flourishing are financial stability, relationship stability, uh, happiness levels, uh, a bunch of different markers. Mm-hmm. Uh, the top people, uh, no, so let me word this differently. Those who believed in something and lived according to that religion, it was specifically religion, had a human flourishment scale of 7.9%. Those who believed in a religion but didn't live it had a happiness or human flourishing scale of 6.9%. That's a, a whole point difference. Those who didn't believe and didn't live it has a had a human flourishment scale of 6.8 so (laughs) you get less happy the less you live not not just that but if you believe in your faith if i believe in this gospel and i don't live according to it if i don't study my scriptures and don't go to church i may as well not believe in anything i'm worse i'm worse off actually that's 0.01% Point zero one percent difference of the human flourishment scale between mm. those who don't believe anything and those who do believe but just can't be bothered to live it. Mm. A whole point difference between those who do. Going to church every week in terms of happiness equates to a 60 grand pay rise. Mm. Add above that all the other actions that faith inspires. So what I'm saying from this is we know the word of God has power. You know that people will be receptive more than you would think because we live in a secular society. So share um, it. So just share it. Be open. Mm -hmm. Uh, You'll find you'll be surprised. That's awesome. Thanks for sharing that. That was really cool. My my scripture that comes to my mind is Alma 36, the classic Alma the Younger, recounting what happens to him, right? And I'll I'll do this. So he says, uh, Yea, and a son. Okay, in 21, he says, Yea, I say unto you, my son, that there could be nothing so exquisite and so bitter as were my pains. Yea, and again, I say unto you, my son, that on the other hand, there can be nothing so exquisite and so sweet as my joy. Hmm. Then, just a couple of verses later, he says, Yea, and from that time forth, the time that he felt those and he repented, from that time forth, even until now, I have labored without ceasing that I might bring souls unto repentance that i might bring them to a taste of the exceeding joy of which i did taste that they might also be born of god and be filled with the holy ghost yea and now behold my son the lord doth give me exceedingly great joy in the fruit of my labors so at the end of the day if you want to feel like pumped up to share the gospel with people you have to be a witness of what that gospel can do and what that means is practicing it as you put forth it, it means repenting. And if you think you don't have something to repent of, you haven't dug deep enough. I, 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 have, I have certain levels that I can dug into my, dig into my psyche and my character because if I go too deep, it becomes so much. Like We don't recognize how much we can become and how much the sins of omission and commission hold us back from, from being that. And so I just think... If, if you are the one who sits in church is like, I've never even thought about sharing the gospel with someone before, it's like, then do your best to live the gospel yourself. And I, I promise you, once you do that, you're not going to be able to shut up about it. Mm-hmm. And I'm curious, going back to what you said, that you kind of sometimes avoid the phrase, I know, when it comes to spiritual matters. Can you expand a little bit on your uh, I kind of think maybe that's a lack of 
of faith because I hear the apostles and brethren at church testify and say, I know that the Book of Mormon is true. What I mean by that is I have no doubt in my mind that it's true. Um, and semantically, you know, the word no is like, uh, I'll tell you, I haven't seen an angel. I haven't had that. I've had spiritual experiences that cause me to not have any doubt. And even when these, you know, there are content creators who like to cast confusion uh, mm -hmm. and try to stoke division. And I've consumed some of that content. And when I have turned to the Book of Mormon straight after, every single question I could have and did have clarified. was clarified. And mm -hmm. so when I say that, it, it's sort of like a, when I go up to the stand and say, I know that God lives, it's like, uh, well, I mean, if if a scholar was to come and, <laughs> and say, D do you know by scientific basis? And I'd say, well, I mean, I guess, I guess, not but i have no doubt in my mind mm -hmm. i have anecdotal mm -hmm. evidence yeah uh, not not empirical or quantitative mm -hmm. but anecdotal personal evidence and uh, you know whoever you are you can't refute that uh, so that that's what i mean yeah. i hope it didn't sound contrary or cynical uh, I, i'm, I'm happy. the exact same way yeah that's yeah it. it's just a weird quirk yeah no i i cuz i agree with you and i want right. to kind of see your motive behind that and i i I have, I, I like to uh, avoid saying, mm, let me restart that. I tend to avoid saying I know because I see that as kind of like a final, like period mm. statement. Like yeah. I just, know yeah. that God lives. I know the Book of Mormon is true. Therefore, boom, like I know the work has been done to come to that knowledge. I know, oh, yeah. right? Yeah. And I see two huge examples in the Book of Mormon right at the beginning. Like you said, you haven't seen an angel. There's some dudes that saw angels yeah, and yeah, they still yeah. struggled like crazy to mm -hmm. keep the commandments of God and stay motivated. Yeah. And this last week in Come Follow Me in 1 Nephi chapter 17, when Nephi receives the commandment to build the boat and he starts building and his brothers mock him and stuff. And he says that he's filled with the power of God so much so if they touched him, they would dry they would wither away like a dried reed or something mm. like that. And then they didn't touch him for a couple of days and God gave him the commandment. He's like, put forth your hand and shock, and I will shock them so that they may know that it is by my power that, you know, you do these things. And so he does, they get shocked or whatever. I always think in the Book of Mormon videos, it's so funny how they portray that. It's, it's like <laughs> they're getting tased or whatever, <laughs> but maybe that's how it was. <laughs> and then it's so funny what they say in verse 55 of uh, chapter 17 after that, it says, this is Lam Laman and Lemuel speaking. It says, we know of a surety we know of a surety that the Lord is with thee, for we know that it is the power of the Lord that has shaken us. Okay? Mm -hmm. They say, we know that God is with you, that you have been commanded by God, essentially, because we know with a surety that the Lord has commanded you. And then the very next page, they're on the boat. And this is what happens. It says... Behold, my brethren and the sons of Ishmael and also their wives began to make themselves merry insomuch that they began to dance and to sing and to speak with much rudeness. And even to that, they did forget by what power they had been brought <laughs> thither and they were lifted up unto exceeding rudeness. Now, we see this throughout because the trend with Nephi, right? He receives a commandment from God or from his dad even, and then he goes and confirms it with the Lord. He does the spiritual work necessary to receive his own answer. Now, this answer was kind of forced upon Laman and Lemuel when they got shook. And then they're like, okay, because we were shook and that has never happened to us before. And that was kind of weird. We know of a surety that the Lord is with you. But then after that, they failed to feed that knowledge. They didn't do the work necessary to really understand that the Lord had mm. called Nephi, right? And so I, I don't like saying that because... I think it's me not knowing for a surety that keeps me motivated, keeps me hungry mm. and seeking after knowledge. Curious and hungry. Yeah. yeah, because I don't, you know, know of a surety yet. But, you know, I don't have What's any like, doubts in my mind like you. Yeah. But. yeah, and I also, I guess I would say this, like what I'm getting from what you're saying is it's irrelevant. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. so what you know, how are you acting? What are you living? Yeah. I mean, we, we read in Hebrews, right, when he's talking, when he's given that dissertation on faith, and he says, even the devils know 
and or I think they say believe or something like that. Like even the devils know Jesus. They know he's the son of God. Or mm. it says even the devils confess that he's the son of God. And then oh, yeah, he talks yeah. about that you should have faith and works. That's a, that's a, it's the same thing that he's talking about faith and works. Yeah. And so it's like, yeah, I don't care if you know the book of Mormon is true. How are you living it? Like I, my curiosity, my curio- like when I meet someone, how they act and who they are makes me want to know what they do and why they do it. And so it's like, you going out and being like, I know that this is an ancient record and uh, it's uh, it's true. Like, so what? What does that have to do with me? But if you're living your life in a way where people are like, man, what is that guy drinking? What is that guy doing? You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. That's when it's going to yeah. matter. But mm-hmm. just knowing that the Book of Mormon true, who cares? It's mm-hmm. like that saying, if you're green, you're growing. If you're ripe, you're rotting. And, mm-hmm. you know, in... In, Dang, dude, say that that's again awesome. for our say it one more time. That in that beautiful accent, yes. say that one more time. If you're green, you're growing. If you're ripe, you're rotting. <laughs> if you're ripe. Have you never heard that? No. Before? Oh, that's you like You sound like classic. C.S. Lewis. <laughs> <laughs> uh, great books, by the way, C.S. Lewis. Yes. Um, and what I mean by that is in, in Britain, we have, a, we have a religious tradition that is mysterious. And there's something I, I have a bit of religious jealousy about that mystery mm-hmm. in that saying i believe is a journey saying i know is a destination and yeah i i just i shared my testimony recently at the stand uh and i i felt to say at the end i do believe truly that the book of mormon is the word of god and i say that because like when i say i know it's like believing feels like a pursuit you know, and, and I think in the context of being open about our faith, when you're telling someone, I know this, they're just like, oh, yeah. you know, oh, you're right and I'm wrong. It's yeah, like, yeah, I believe this. Exactly. And suddenly they're respectful about what you believe mm-hmm. because it's less arrogant. And they're like, you believe that. That's really cool that you believe that. I know this. True. Well, that's a bit. Of, and so what yeah. if you know? I guess that's the whole point. <laughs> yeah. So what? Like, why should yeah. someone care yeah. if you if you know something? You know what I mean? Mm. Especially like if... When they, when they ask you, how do you know? Then then you just tell your beliefs about it based on experiences you've had. You you explain beliefs. You don't explain knowledge after yeah. that. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it, know, exactly. it doesn't well, make yeah, it doesn't so, work. I mean, we learn in the famous verses that are quoted in the introduction of the Book of Mormon, Moroni, you know, 10, 3 through 5, right? It says, by the power of the Holy Ghost, you may know the truth of all things. Mm-hmm. So it's not saying, not to say that, you know, because we've had the experiences, we don't know, right? I, I think it's more just like, and maybe it's because of our language has adopted, you know, definitions for things that are different than, you know, the definitions mm-hmm. when they wrote the scriptures, yeah. right? Yeah. Because yeah. no so, also meant something else back in the biblical <laughs> exactly. days too. <laughs> exactly, bro. <laughs> exactly. No, but that's a, that's a really good point. Um, yeah, I was going to say something, but I've forgotten. Um, yeah. Which isn't good for podcasts, is it? No, it's supposed to be eloquent. <laughs> no, but yeah, I, I think, yeah, we can know the truth of all things. We can know things from a spiritual standpoint. But just like you're saying, I think that's more of a destination. And belief is also, too, like when I share the gospel, like with Marines and stuff, and I say I believe these things, I, I have found in my experience, they're a lot more curious to ask, like, why do you believe yeah. that? Belief Instead of folks' curiosity. No is like, mm. Yeah. Case closed. Yeah. You're not listening. You're not even interested in hearing. Like if you know two and two plus two, then you're not going to want to hear. Two and two plus yeah. two. Uh, yeah. Two and two equals. But, but ima- <laughs> imagine someone saying the same thing about yeah. a political belief they had. Yeah. And they said, yeah. no, I know that. This, I know Trump is the best uh, president. And then you're, and then yeah. people are like, well, that's not going to convert anyone to believing that. But if you say, no. well, actually, I believe that this and this and this and then they think well i I could be a bit more respectful about that but it it goes back to what you said about what are you doing about it we know that when we stop keeping the commandments and doing the things we ought to the light which we have received is taken away even that which has already been given is taken away Mm -hmm. and so it's like yeah you know but that doesn't mean anything really it might help someone in their faith journey but for you if you see that as a destination then it stops your curiosity and you stop going and that thing which you already know you start to realize actually i don't really know that anymore i've got to get my head into it you know mm, yeah so yeah well ben after this conversation i want to go down i want i want to go to like 
Los Angeles, downtown Los Angeles, stand on a soapbox and start preaching, man. Like I'm fired <laughs> up right now. You know what I mean? Like I just, I love the word of God. I love the book of Mormon. Your insights have been amazing. And so I appreciate you sharing those. What do you want to share with everyone before we, where you go? Where can they find you? And, and if there's any last testimony you want to, you want to share? Uh, well, firstly, I would say it's, it's not me. It's, it's the book of Mormon and it's, it's God. I, I feel very privileged to have been the beneficiary of personal revelation. And I tested President Nelson's practical advice for revelation. Get a notebook, say a prayer, listen. And the Book of Mormon helps me in that because uh, my brain is full when I'm working and stuff. I've got constant things on my mind. But when I look in the Book of Mormon, I say a prayer. I have specific questions. Every day I've got questions, you know. Yeah. Um, and read the Book of Mormon. And my hand's just going, my hand's going. And then I read back, I, I've got an Apple note on here as well that um, can prove it if anyone's doubting. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so the Book of Mormon is the word of God. I believe it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have no doubt in my mind that it is. It's, uh, I, I'm grateful to know that. And, you know, if, if you want to share in my faith journey, you can subscribe for all the saints. And we've got an Instagram that we try to share valuable, um, uplifting content that hopefully when you're doom scrolling there's a bit of the opposite Something, to doom yeah uh the same as you guys you know we're just trying to help people aren't we and and learn ourselves like mm. it's it's great thank you for having me on well thanks for suffering through the jet lag to no know, no you I are my personal favorite paul brothers of content creation Heck yeah uh, there's only hear one that other jake option. and logan <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just don't start wrestling and boxing and doing we were thinking about doing lds oh. like boxing <laughs> matches with like we'll have like <laughs> ex-mormons or mormons yeah that matches. would be awesome can i be the guy with the mic down <laughs> yeah the ceiling, uh, get ready to rumble <laughs> no that's awesome well we appreciate it and until actually you're gonna say the tagline but i want you to do your best american accent say stay curious and hungry in your best american accent uh, you know, I played Heber C. Kimball in the British pageant, and they had me do an American, American accent, accent in that. So, okay. you know, hear it. Say, I shouldn't have said why did I say yeah, that? Well then, yeah. It was rubbish then, it's rubbish now. <laughs> we'll just say, until uh, next time, stay curious and hungry, your best American accent. Do you want like Southern drawl or general just ge- Utah Mundy? Or, you, you know, Utah. I Utah. actually probably can't do that. But <clears throat> until next time, stay curious and hungry. <laughs> <laughs> and turn off YouTube and go get in the scriptures. Yeah. Awesome. Dude, man, <laughs> that was so fun, dude. That was really fun. That was one of my favorite episodes. I love-